Hi guys, NCWQ here, and today we have an article coming from Los Angeles Times. And this article says, Biggest California earthquake in decades ruptured on at least 24 faults. When an earthquake strikes, the instinct of many Californians is to ask which fault ruptured. The Newport Englewood, the Hayward, the mighty San Andreas. But scientists are increasingly saying it's not that simple. New research shows that the Ridgecrest earthquakes that began on July ruptured at least two dozen faults. It's the latest evidence of how small faults can join together to produce a large earthquake and how those quakes can cover a wider area than expected. The findings are important in helping understand how earthquakes can grow in the seconds after a fault ruptures when two blocks of quakes of earth move away from each other and areas blanketed by crisscross patterns of faults an earthquake on a smaller fault can destabilize bigger ones beginning a process that leads to a much stronger earthquake in the case of ridgecrest some follow-up earthquakes came seconds after the largest one came some 34 hours later it has only been in recent decades that earthquake scientists have understood how smaller faults in California joined together to create a more powerful earthquake. After the 1999 Landers earthquake, scientists were astonished to find that the magnitude 7.3 Tembler in Mojave Desert had ruptured on five separate faults. As the years have gone by, more evidence has accumulated that earthquakes can and do happen on multiple faults, such as the magnitude 7.1 Hector Mine earthquake about 20 miles east of Landers Quake and the magnitude 7.2 quake on Easter Sunday 2010 near Mexicali. Detailed observations outlined recently in the journal Science by experts at Caltech and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory underscore how scientists' understanding of earthquake fault ruptures has evolved. Researchers discovered the 4th of July Ridgecrest Tembler was actually three distinct earthquakes, magnitude 6.1, 6.2, and 6.2 on a trio of faults. Added together, they produced enough energy to create a magnitude 6.4 Tembler, said Zachary Ross, Caltech assistant professor of geophysics and the lead author of the paper. The first two quakes ruptured at right angles to each other, forming the shape of the capital letter L. The first to the northwest and southeast, the second to the southwest. The third quake also ruptured to the southwest. The faults ruptured over 12 seconds. That's something we haven't seen before, and it's detailed on such a small scale, said Caltech seismologist Engel Hoxson, a co-author and expert on Southern California seismology. The second large quake on July 5th was actually made up of four smaller events that ruptured over 22 seconds, producing a magnitude 7.1, the most powerful in California in the last 20 years. In the same event, at least 20 smaller faults that intersected the main fault also ruptured, according to the study, making the zone Atlanta top move, moving faults wider than might be expected. And uh, this this here shows what um what I'm looking at here. So we'll show this real quick. This is the multiple faults here and how they changed. So those are how the seg segments happened. The geometry of this fault network is just incredibly complicated, Ross said. These faults are unmapped. Many of them are at right angles to each other. They're criss-cutting each other. In the central portion of it, they are spaced a few kilometers apart, like dominoes. There's 20 of them in a row. This 7.1 ripped through all of these. The results provide even more evidence to support the idea that California faults, once thought to be limited by their individual length, can actually link together and a much more massive earthquake. For instance, as cited in the 1993 study in the journal Science, co-authored by Hoxson, previous estimates had suggested only earthquakes of magnitude 6.9 or less would be expected in the Landers area. The magnitude 7.3 earthquake that hit produced quadruple the shaking energy of what had been expected. 
The point is that Lander's earthquake and this earthquake are daisy-chaining up faults that previously were thought to rupture only by themselves, and that's an important observation, Hawkson said. These earthquakes have connected together segments that were thought to be independent before, but now have been shown to actually connect in one big earthquake. So instead of earthquake strain being relieved by many magnitude 6 tremblers over a number of faults, you could just do it one magnitude 7 by having the rupture travel up and jump from one fault to the next, Hawkson said. A modest fault that begins to move in a quake can make it easier for neighboring fault to rupture, Hawkson said. In the ridge crest... In Ridgecrest, the 4th of July earthquake probably kept on hammering strong spots along seismically strained faults until the larger magnitude 7.1 ruptured on July 5th, Hawkson said. The study raises the possibility that past earthquakes actually may have been bigger than previously thought. A prehistoric earthquake currently identified by a rupture of a fault at one site might have produced even more powerful power if scientists hadn't yet discovered other fault segments that ruptured in the same event, the study said. That may sound ominous, but there's a silver lining according to seismologist Lucy Jones, who was not involved in the study. If supersized earthquakes are more likely, that means there would be fewer damaging tremblers over any given time period. You won't need to have another earthquake for a much longer time, Jones says. What's worse, one eight or six sevens, Jones asked. It's not clear that one eight is worse than six seven point fives. There's a lot of damage that happens in each individual event. And at high magnitudes, there's only so much the ground can shake before the rocks break. So the worst shaking caused by the magnitude 7 quake and a magnitude 8 is not that much different. A magnitude 8 quake, however, would bring destructive shaking to a much larger area of California, and its duration would be longer. The RidgeQuest study and information gleaned from other recent quakes also has highlighted the importance of understanding how ruptures along multiple faults may affect a broader area. In New Zealand, scientists were stunned at the bizarre map of the faults ruptured in the magnitude 7.8 Kaikoura earthquake in 2016, resembling an upside-down trident aimed at a silhouette of an eagle. And this is what that looks like. So we'll show this here. And this was this quake here for Kagura. In Kaikoura earthquake, there were multiple ruptures over a wide area, and that's kind of mind-boggling, Hawkson said. And it's important because that means a lot of more people were affected. The surface rupture and the surface ground shaking are spread over a much wider area. On a practical level, the research underscores the potential limitations of state earthquake zones designated to prevent new construction directly on top of faults, Hawkson said. If a single major fault can be crossed by many shorter perpendicular faults and officials want to avoid new construction on top of active faults, the zones might need to be larger than they are now, he said. Further analysis needs to be done to determine whether the 20 cross faults identified in the Ridgecrest study using computer analysis of shaking records actually broke the ground at the surface, according to Tim Dawson, a senior engineering geologist with the California Geological Survey. The Ridgecrest quakes occurred in a region already known to be profoundly pro complex, where there are many structurally immature baby faults that crisscross one another, the USC earth science professor James Doing. It's just very, very interesting to see one of these faults message all the breaking at the same time in a big earthquake, Dolan said. A significant achievement of the study, Dolan said, was being able to image, imagine, or image, um, image, what faults look like deep underground at a depth where earthquakes begin. The old convert conventional wisdom was that the structurally complex nature of faults at the surface become simplified the deeper you go. What this study proves is that the structural complexity continues deep underground where earthquakes begin, Dolan said. That's important, Dolan said, because it helps scientists determine where future earthquakes are likely to stop, which tends to happen where faults become structurally complicated. Anyways, you guys, hope y'all enjoyed this article. I thought I would share it with y'all. And I hope y'all are having a great day or night wherever you are in the world. Much love.